This is the third in a series of messages called Beginnings. It's based on the book of Genesis. I think uh, uh, the message today may generate some questions in your mind. So as I'm talking, if you think of something, well, what about that? Uh, uh, just, just make a note of it. And at the end, I'll give uh, opportunity for several of you to ask questions. Whether you're single or married, a uh, teenager or an empty nester, uh, it's important to understand where you came from and how the world began. Uh, maybe you don't believe in God, but stick with me. You should at least listen to what God says about how, how everything began. In uh, our text today, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, we learn that God created human beings. Um, as I shared with you last week, the Bible doesn't begin with Genesis. It begins with the empty tomb. Jesus was raised from the dead. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, there would have been no reason to write about him. But at least four authors uh, documented the life of Christ. Uh, Jesus commissioned then the New Testament writers to write the New Testament. And uh, that was combined then with the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. Uh, it's because Jesus commissioned the New Testament writers and he's the one that said everything in the Old Testament is true. It's God's truth uh, that we believe that God created human beings. Genesis tells us the universe didn't create us. We didn't evolve from lower life forms. We didn't come into being by chance mutations. We were created by God. So turn to uh, Genesis 1 in your Bible where we learn about uh, creation. In chapter 1, verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, uh, he created them. Uh, the word, uh, from this text, we learned four things uh, about our beginnings. Uh, we learned uh, things that make a huge difference in how we view ourselves, how we view other people and treat other people, and about our purpose. One, God created humans in his image. 26 again, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Uh, the worth of every man and woman, every boy and girl is established right here at the beginning of the Bible. Uh, Genesis 1 is the basis for the golden rule. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, loving your neighbor is not obvious in nature. Uh, the secularist viewpoint provides no basis for human worth. If we evolve by chance mutations from worthless molecules, and when we die, we just return to the earth, and that's the end, there's no basis for human worth there. Imago Dei, the Latin words for in the image of God, from Genesis, we learn that we created in God's image. So be careful how you treat people. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, we read, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So Solomon tells us that God has put eternity in every human heart, all 7.5 billion people on this earth. Uh, everybody has a sense that there's something more than what we see in this world. That when we die, that's not the end. There's something beyond. Everybody has a sense that there must be a God. Not everybody believes in God, but God has imprinted that eternity in each one of us. Create, created in the image of God is the uh, doctrine that everyone matters. Every child, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman matters to God. Parent, if you have uh, a son or daughter struggling with how they feel about themselves, take them to Genesis 1. Their worth is established right there that they were created in God's image. Genesis 1, uh, we get the fundamental belief that we are all equal. We were all made in God's image. 
Uh, John Adams, the second president of uh, the United States, was a strong Christian. He writes, the doctrine of human equality is founded entirely in the Christian doctrine that we are all children of the same father, all accountable to him for our conduct to one another. And then he goes on. Common sense was sufficient to determine that it could not mean that all men were created equal in fact, but in right. Not all equally tall, strong, wise, handsome, active, but equally men. The work of the same artist. Children in the same cases entitled to the same just justice. Genesis 1 provides the foundation for our legal system. All humans are entitled to the same justice. Adam says that equality was the heart of Christian faith. Love your neighbor as yourself comes from the fact that we were created in the image of God. Uh, Genesis 1 has tremendous implications for how we view ourselves and how we treat other people. We treat everyone with dignity, regardless of their race, their color, their sex, their background. We treat them with kindness because we know they are made in God's image. We speak up for the unborn, the mentally disadvantaged, the disabled, or any whose society would brush aside and say they're less than human. Uh, Ed Stewart, in his book, Millennium's Eve, talks about the importance of us serving other people. He talks about a group of Christians who built a, a home a school and a hospital to minister to AIDS patients and drug addicts, uh, the disabled, and uh, society's throwaways. Dorothy was one such gal. She sat in the back of a university introduction to speech class. The teacher was a Christian man who was great at encouraging students. During the first day of class, this teacher was going around the room having the students introduce themselves. Each student was to respond to the questions, what do I like about myself and what don't I like about myself? When it came Dorothy's turn to introduce herself, there was only silence in the room. Thinking perhaps she had not heard the question, the teacher moved over near her and gently repeated the question. Again, there was only silence. Finally, with a deep sigh, Dorothy sat up in her chair, pulled back her hair, and in the process revealed her face. Covering nearly all of one side of her face was a large, irregularly shaped birthmark, nearly as red as her hair. That, she said, should show you what I don't like about myself. Moved with compassion, this godly professor leaned over and gave her a hug. Then he kissed her on her cheek where the birthmark was and said, that's okay, honey. God and I still think you're beautiful. Dorothy cried uncontrollably for almost 20 minutes. Soon other students had gathered around her and were offering their comfort as well. When she finally could talk, she dabbed the tears from her eyes and said to the professor, I've wanted so much for someone to hug me and say what you say. Why couldn't my parents do that? My mother won't even touch my face. Made in the image of God is the doctrine that we all matter. John Calvin, who's often thought to be a narrow dogmatician, draws remarkable implications from this teaching in Genesis 1 that we're all made uh, in the image of God, Imago Dei. Think about what he writes in light of today's political divide where uh, the hatred from one side to the other seems palpable. Calvin writes, remember not to consider men's evil intention, but to look upon the image of God in them, which cancels their transgressions, and with its beauty and dignity allures us to love and embrace them. Calvin says, look at, when you look at other people, don't look that they disagree with you, or that they have different values, or they have different ways of going about uh, their point, but notice that they're made in the image of God. And that gives you a shot at being civil with other people. Since we're all made in the image of God, as we go out this week as full-time ministers for Christ, Christians should not think that their role is strictly to lead people to Christ and bring them into the church, as important as that is. We all work for the common good 
of people. We go to McKay to help children learn English and learn to read better and do math better. We help in our schools to make them better schools. We serve at Edgewood uh, Assisted Living Center to help the, serve the elderly. We work to make our, safe, our city safer rather than plagued by violence. We work to build uh, an economic prosperity rather than a city where there are few jobs. We work for a state of peace that, rather than one marked by violence. We serve the elderly, the chronically ill, single parents, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. Some call for a society of absolute inclusion. They urge us to accept that there's not right and wrong, but we're to accept all values as equally valid and all viewpoints. But as soon as you call for absolute inclusion, inevitably it leads to a new exclusion. For example, if you believe that there's no right and wrong, there's no evil, well then people that believe in right and wrong and evil become the bad people. And so absolute inclusion never quite works out. It's impossible to practice. Now, is there anything between the poles of affirming that all viewpoints are equal and excluding people who don't agree with us? Jesus tells us the way. Love your enemies. The people you disagree with, disagree with you, and pray for those who persecute you. If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Pagans are like non-Jews, Gentiles. Jesus says that not every one is right and good. Not all viewpoints are equal, but all human beings are made in the image of God are equally important regardless of their beliefs. We're to love them. Two, God created humans to rule over creation. 126 again, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So that they may, now this is the unimaginable part, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God said you're not to worship uh, animals, make them idols, you're to rule over them. You're not to worship nature, you're to rule over nature. All religions, other than the Hebrew one, uh, taught that uh, we worship nature and animals. God says, no, you don't worship nature. You rule over nature. Now, studying the vastness of our universe and so, has led some people to include that human beings can't be very significant. We're small in a vast universe. But if you measure uh, significance by size, whales would be the most important creatures. But I don't hear anybody arguing that. The writer to the Hebrews says, What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. Put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. We're called to rule over the earth, but we're not, uh, it's difficult for us to rule over some things. We're not doing very good at ruling over lions or snakes or tsunamis and earthquakes. Uh, but Jesus we see, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everything. Jesus won the victory over sin and death, so now rules over all creation. And when he returns again, we'll be restored to our rightful place of ruling not over just some of nature, but all of nature. In this world where there's, you know, storms and troubles and tragedies that happen, we often feel like we're not ruling over creation. The world seems kind of chaotic, out of control. 
Uh, we may face setbacks and rejections. Chi Jang in his book, Rejection Proof, tells about uh, in his early years, his greatest fear was rejection. And so he decided to do uh, a, a little study of rejection and he decided he would do a hundred things where he would for sure be rejected. Um, and so as he, he began to study rejection, he learned that a lot of uh, famous authors were turned down by many publishers. Uh, William Golding was turned down 20 times before he got Lord of the Flies published. Anne Frank was turned down 15 times before she got The Diary of a Young Girl published. Uh, Catherine Stockett was turned down by 60 publishers before getting the help printed. And, and J.K. Rowling was turned down 12 times. You may not know that before she got Harry Potter published. Uh, and it wasn't, he learned, it wasn't just the numbers. Uh, it was the feedback these authors got from the publishers. Some of them were very harsh. The girl doesn't, it seems to me, have a special perception or feeling which could lift that book above the curiosity level, the publisher said about Anne Frank. An absurd and uninteresting fantasy which was rubbish and dull, dull on Lord of the Flies. It's far too long for children on Harry Potter. Rowling was turned down by 12 different British publishers. Bloomsbury, uh, the head editor at Bloomsbury, handed the manuscript to her granddaughter who couldn't put it down until she finished the whole thing. So Bloomsbury finally gave uh, Harry Potter uh, the green light. Since God has called us to rule over the earth, when we get knocked down, we can't stay down. We have to get up and keep trying. God has made us in his image with minds and bodies able to master the universe. So we must keep on trying. It's tough to find world peace. You know, I see leaders trying over and over again, year after year, for peace in the Middle East. It seems impossible, but we have to keep trying. It's tough to govern people. It's hard to govern a large group of people, a large country. We're finding it very difficult to find a cure for cancer, but we have to keep trying. It's tough to forge a strong marriage, but you have to keep trying. It's difficult to raise good children, but you've got to keep going. Three, God created humans, male and female. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1 tells us that God created men and women equal from the beginning. Uh, ladies, I believe every woman in this world should become a Christian. Jesus lifted up women more than any other person in history. And due to Jesus, the New Testament writers lifted up women. All four gospel writers make a point that, the, that women were the first ones to discover the empty tomb. That is not an insignificant detail. Genesis tells us that human beings, male and female, were created equal from the beginning. God gave women value and dignity. Christopher Hitchens, I mentioned last week, wrote, God is not great. And in it, he scoffs at Christian faith. He's an atheist. Um, he laughs at all the detailed laws in the Hebrew uh, law. There are 19 sexual prohibitions uh, in Exodus and Leviticus. You say, yeah, that's why I'm not a Christian. There goes God getting involved in the bedroom where he doesn't belong. Who would want to follow a God like that? Well, let me tell you something about these laws. All 19 were practiced in Canaan. Whenever we study a historical document, it's always important to interpret it in its context. The reason God gave so many detailed commands, uh, sexual prohibitions, is because they were practiced in Canaan where the Hebrew people were going. He says, I don't want you to be like them. You are to be different. 
Today, in every developed nation in the world, 17 out of the 19 are either illegal or frowned upon. So the Hebrew people, uh, the commands God gave them put them way ahead of their time. Let me, I'll give you one example. Leviticus 18.6. No one who is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. Does that seem reasonable to you? It does to me. But it wasn't to the Canaanites and it wasn't to the Egyptians. 1,500 years later, the Romans were finally getting around to see the wisdom of God's commands. But the Egyptians were still practicing this. They're st the monarchs were still marrying their siblings. Don't skip over uh, the, the details in, uh, in the, the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, saying, you know, those are silly, those are outdated. The Hebrew law established protections for women and children that put them way ahead of their time. Why were they established? Because we're all created in the image of God. It would take centuries for the rest of the world to catch up. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Do you know, do you know why Adam's first day was his longest? Because there was no Eve. Nineteen. Moving on. <laughs> now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. God says, I'm through warming up. Then he made woman, which was his final upgrade. Here we go. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Here we find the basis for marriage in the first, the second chapter of the Bible. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Moses' point is that there was not evil in the world at that point. They were pure. Everything God made was good. Four, God created humans to display his glory. Now here we come to our purpose. As you read through Genesis 1 and 2, you see that out of all the things God made, the, the sun, the moon, the oceans, all the amazing things, that the pinnacle of his creation was the creation of us. More verses are devoted to the creation of mankind in the first two chapters of Genesis than anything else. David writes in Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Uh, such uh, an, a, an importance is placed on children in the Bible. Uh, children, uh, you know, they just naturally know that there's a God uh, and they just blurt out the truth. A Sunday school teacher was teaching about Lot's wife, that she turned back and turned into a uh, pillar of salt. And Johnny uh, quipped in, she said, my mom was driving and she turned back and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, now he's going to mention the top thing in God's creation. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, birds in the sky, fish in the sea, all that swims, the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God created human beings and 
we bring glory to him. God created human beings in his image. Therefore, we're to treat everyone with dignity and kindness. God created humans to rule over creation. We've been given the minds to be able to master the universe. God created humans, male and female. No worldview lifts up women like the Christian faith. From the beginning, God made males and females equal. And God created humans to display his glory. You were created to bring glory to God. Do you feel like you're bringing glory to God? You can pray to Jesus right now and tell him you believe he's the son of God, he died for your sins, he rose from the dead, invite him into your life and you can begin to bring glory to God starting today. Then you can live out your purpose for which God created human beings. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the first two chapters in the Bible where we learned that the universe didn't create us. We didn't evolve from lower life forms, but you created us. And you created us in your image. Infinitely valuable. So we're to treat everybody with dignity. I want to give you a moment to pray right now to God and thank him that you're created in his image. Maybe you don't feel that way. Tell him you say you understand now that you're valuable. And that you're going to try to treat other people with dignity and look for God's image in them. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you could invite him into your life right now. You pray. Thank you, Father, for the opening chapters in your word telling us that we are of infinite value and all other people are as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.